Next, uh, Dr. Naomi Krogman is a professor of environmental sociology in the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology here at the University of Alberta. Her research has been on sustainable consumption, environmental policy implementation, resource management, and social impacts of large industrial development. Dr. Krogman is currently the academic director of the Office of Sustainability and working on a variety of initiatives to better integrate sustainability content into curriculum, research, and academic programming at the University of Alberta. The title of her presentation, Personal Sustainability Plans Linked to the Collective Good. Dr. Krogman. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming today. My most important message to you is that the world needs you, and I think you can do more good if you have a plan, a philosophy, an orientation to a lifetime of contributions. Do, oh, okay. I was looking for my clicker. So this talk is inspired by the many students I have worked with who have come to me with courage and hope about how they can contribute to a more sustainable future for the planet. We are here together in an important turning point in history where we are really beginning to understand the toll the last 50 years has had on the Earth's systems and how our economic system needs to change to provide livelihoods and dignity for all. I currently have the pleasure of working with the Office of Sustainability to help further our academic strengths in this area. What I like about the University of Alberta's definition of sustainability are the words thrive and perpetuity. This commitment to future generations is missing in too many discussions about sustainability. Ronald Wright goes as far to say, forget sustainability, just think long term. This definition is similar to Ehrenfeld and Hoffman's definition in their book, Flourishing, a frank conversation about sustainability where they argue that sustainability is the possibility that human and other life forms will flourish on the earth forever. Too often we might hear the word sustainability and think it is just about sustaining what we have, but we need to reverse a lot of the damage that has already been done, and we need to imagine a world in which there is a greater well-being across countries and across the population within countries. When you think of the number of people who are unable to help to try and change our current trajectory, because they are isolated, or they are mentally ill, or they are physically impaired, or they're working two or three jobs, or they're just coping, taking care of themselves or others, it becomes all the more important that those in a position to contribute to change do so. Everyone is busy, so that's not really an excuse. When we talk of sustainability, we are talking about systems, such as the ways in which our well-being and our environment is tied to individual community, regional, and international dynamics. It is tied to systems of land health, production, consumption, and waste streams. From this vantage point, we see we are connected to various systems, whether we want to be or not. Recognizing our part in this larger system, we see that Canadians generally use a disproportionate amount of the Earth's resources. Canadians have an ecological footprint of seven to hectares per person, whereas the global average is about two hectares per person. And as you know, this is because we are big consumers of energy and stuff. In fact, Calgarians and Edmontonians have the highest per capita household waste across the nation. We need to keep in mind that as we earn higher incomes, despite perhaps being more educated, about our ecological footprint and even having stronger environmental values, at least reportedly from surveys, our lifestyles often result in consuming more. The high ecological footprint of those in higher income categories is not significantly offset by buying Priuses and other green products. We cannot shop our way to safety, as Andrew Saz says nor can we shop our way to sustainability. As most of you are well aware, climate change impacts are here, and the impacts are already felt in a myriad of ways. Bill McKibben and others are arguing that even, that given the current momentum of climate change impacts, we need to be prepared to build community more than anything else, exactly what David Kahane was talking about. Because ultimately, 
We're going to have a lot of unexpected disruptions, and we're going to need each other. We're going to need each other to figure out how to recover and to change the way we live and to contribute to systemic change. Another background trend that will require, at its essence, a more sharing and cooperative approach is our ability to address worsening inequality. It is common knowledge that, that about half of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. More close to home, in 1960, the average pay after taxes for a chief executive at the largest U.S. corporations was 12 times greater than the average wage of factory workers. In 1980, the average CEO was making 42 times as much as the average blue-collar worker. By the year 2000, it jumped to 531 times higher. In Zygmunt Bauman's recent book, Does the Richness of a Few Benefit Us All?, he contends, the wealth amassed at the top of society has blatantly failed to trickle down and make the rest of us any richer or more secure or happier or more optimistic about our future and our children's future. And simply, the harsh realities of social inequality are bad for almost anyone. So now I get to my point. The problems of overconsumption and climate change and social inequality need our personal attention or a personal plan to roll up our sleeves and take part in social change. I fear we try to achieve the elixir of health, happiness, and accomplishment too often as individuals. We can seek health, happiness, and accomplishment together. We have thousands of self-help books and magazines and life coaches and makeovers and personal trainers and financial advisors and lots of leadership training and personal goal setting. Much of the message that comes from this individualistic focus is to stand out, protect yourself, and get ahead. I believe an important antidote to this is to add to our schools and our university classes, our very culture, the notion of a personal sustainability plan. In these plans, we would recognize ourselves as part of the system, as powerful contributors to a better future for our current cohabitants on this earth and those to follow. Your personal sustainability plan would not be dictated to you. It's your own to design within your family, your culture, within your capacity. But it would likely address these items. It would address your upstream decisions. That is, those decisions we make that have a large downstream effect on our entire lives' ecological footprint. Secondly, it would, be, it would, it would address how we commit to something that is larger than ourselves, a larger purpose that we care about, that we want to protect or change or share more with others. And third, it would talk, we would address how we are willing to work with others and in some cases be politically involved. Just listening to David, I realize the amount of savvy that it takes to be able to understand how to push something forward. But that takes trial and error and it takes persistence and it takes sustained commitment. And that's why I think we have to commit to something because the one-shot deal is not necessarily going to get us there. These upstream decisions carry with them by default many actions that have an impact on the environment that are coded into that key pivotal choice which carries with it constraints and opportunities that may be fixed in your life for some time. Where you live, for example, has a great deal to do with how much energy you will consume to get to work, to see loved ones, to go to school. By virtue of being in this country, our children have a much greater environmental impact than children do in lesser developed countries. And Julian did a nice job of explaining how much more energy we're using as Canadians than people in developing countries. The work you do and how you carry your values of sustainability to the workplace often has a significant influence on your ecological footprint and the social consequences for others. Whereas the average home was 900 square feet in Edmonton in 1950, it is 2,100 square feet now, and these homes are much larger that we're seeing in the new subdivisions that we're building right on the very agricultural land that you're talking about. Your healthy habits carry over into your effect on other people. We're finding there's lots of research that says we're more sensitive to the norms around us than we are to being bombarded with information or messages of guilt. So the norms you demonstrate, the needs you have, the norms you demonstrate, for example, around healthy habits also have a huge impact on the needs you will have from our healthcare system and the energy you will have to give back. 
The second part of a personal sustainability plan would address where you want to invest some of your energies for a higher purpose. It can be a place you care about, pay attention to, try to protect or heal or share with others. If you ever look at, for example, the amount of natural areas in Edmonton that have disappeared in the last 20 years, um, you know, we would, we would wish that there were more people that were fiercely protective of those areas that have been turned into um, other buildings and roads and, and such. It can be a people you are concerned about in your own community or in a broader community of indigenous people, people of color, or a group disadvantaged by poverty or political persecution or discrimination, or a group you simply want to celebrate more to others for their skills or resourcefulness or for their creativity inspires the rest of us. It can be a policy area such as food justice or healthcare or wetland policy or city planning for walkability or an area of passion for perhaps something you want to see preserved because it's tied to a culture that is thriving and flourishing. The area of passion could be a botanical collection or a period of music, accessibility to recreation, or theater for all. Notably absent in this list is the accumulation of material things. Investing is all too often about investing in our financial future, but we might have actually bigger things at stake. We can do 10 things to save the environment, but where we really make a difference is where we organize with others to enhance or heal or change something that requires more voice, collective wisdom, political influence, and long-term persistence to make it happen. The skills you gain by working with others can enrich your work life as well as give you the hope, the courage, and momentum to strive even when the chips are down, even when the goals seem too far off, even when others criticize or minimize what you do. The evidence from recent research is overwhelming in terms of the benefits of being connected to others, giving our time, our energy, our money to a purpose for the collective good. We are in fact healthier and happier when we get outside ourselves. We have so many opportunities at the University of Alberta to organize and collaborate with others for a higher purpose. And what the literature shows is that people have fun doing this, that they find themselves attending events and organizational meetings as much for the joy of friendship and learning as they do carrying out the work of the organization. These opportunities shown here are just those out of our Office of Sustainability. There are dozens of student organizations that focus on social justice and environmental collective goods, for example, that are connected with our larger community. In fact, many of these experiences help students land jobs after they graduate. Personal sustainability plans allow you to take part in sustainability in a real, authentic, personal way, where you imagine a lifetime of contributions, some of which your children will reap and you will not. You become part of long-term thinking that is at the core of sustainability. You embrace the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, and you help shape political will to change the direction of our future. In your plan, you can reflect on who has influenced you in this lifetime, like my family members who took me camping and fishing and taught me about hard work on a farm. Remember that being, by being the change you wish to see, you are changing the norms of others, those others around you, and you may not even know they're watching you and they're admiring you and they're going to copy you. Thank you. Be happy to take some questions or comments.